This week's episode is brought to you by the Smart People Podcast Mastermind. You've probably heard Chris talking about it in previous episodes. And if you're interested in taking a survey, head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com slash mastermind. And now on to the show. The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm Chris Stemp. Thanks so much for joining us today. So excited for our guest this week. I've been trying to get her on the show for quite some time. She wanted to come on. She's just extremely busy because she's very good at her job. This week on the show, we have Mary Roach, and she is a five-time New York Times bestselling author. Guess how many books she's written? She's written five, so if you get the point I'm making here, she just prints out bestsellers. She just takes them straight to the bank, and it's because she's funny, it's great, her writing's fantastic, and the topics are incredible, ones that I'm sure you would enjoy because we're all in this together. We like similar things. I'll give you a rundown of some of the books she has written. She's written Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Spook, Science Tackles the Afterlife, Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex, Packing for Mars, The Curious Science of Life in the Void, and her most recent book is Gulp, Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. If you'll notice, right, she's very much a like one-word title, Gulp, Bonk, Spook, blah, blah, blah. But what we get into in this episode is... First of all, what's it like to be a constant New York Times bestselling author? How do you do it? What's the secret sauce? What's your writing style like? And also things like, how do you choose your topics? I mean, this just sounds like the best job ever. You just go, what am I interested in? All right, fine. I'll write a bestselling book. But then we also, the second half of the interview, we talk about her most recent book, Gulp. As I mentioned, the subtitle is Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. As you'll go on to hear in the episode, the alimentary canal is basically from your mouth to your butt. Um, It's the whole trip that food takes when it comes into your mouth and when it goes out your butt. I think that's all you need to know. So we're going to get into the episode with Mary. Guys, I want to reiterate, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, we mentioned we are starting a Smart People Podcast Mastermind. Thank you to those of you that have taken the survey. It is sparking great conversations, thought. We are currently creating this amazing platform for us all to connect, to learn deeper. You know, I came up with a tagline, right? Check this out. The podcast teaches you the who knew. The mastermind teaches you the how to. So if you think about it, right, we have entrepreneurs on the podcast. We have five-time best-selling authors. We have coaches and psychiatrists and all this stuff and we learn it's fantastic but how do we go deeper how do we put this stuff into use so imagine mary roach giving a webinar on how to write best-selling books well those are the kind of things we are going to do in our mastermind additionally we're going to come up with some great ways where those in the mastermind can connect and really how we can accomplish those things that we want to get done so if this sounds interesting, all you got to do, head to smartpeoplepodcast.com slash mastermind. There's a short survey. You can take that, leave your email address, and when this does get off the ground, there might be something special in it for those of you that take the survey. Smartpeoplepodcast.com slash mastermind. Tell us what you think. Give us some ideas. What do you want? We can always add to it and create more value. All right, here it is. We're talking to Mary Roach about how to just continually write best-selling books, and on her new book, Gulp. Enjoy. Mary, first I wanted to just say thank you so much for being on the show. I've, I've been waiting a long time to have you on. You're one of my favorite authors, and so thank you again for taking the time. Oh, pshaw. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm delighted to be on. So... 
as as many know and many may not, you you just churn out bestsellers. How many do you have at this point? Do you know New York Times bestsellers? Uh, five. <laughs> five. Five. So yeah. is, is that basically every book you've ever written? Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> I feel really weird. Saying, oh yeah, I. You know what? Only once in my life I've been done this. There was this guy, and he was kind of a turd, and he's like, "Oh, you're a writer. You what kind of books do you write?" You know, thinking that. I, you know, somebody pretends to exactly. be, what kind of books do you write? And I said, bestsellers. Yes. <laughs> Pow. I love that. Well, look, own it, right? It's, it's not like you got here just out of pure luck. Although I'm sure you would say some of it might be luck, but so I want to, I want to start from the beginning because when we have authors such as yourself who have just reached this level of success, I like to know the the background. So have you always written? Have you always wanted to be a writer? No, not not at all. Uh, I was your sort of generic liberal arts college student who didn't give any thought whatsoever to a career and what would come next. I just lived for the next party. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I just thought, well, I don't know. I went to Wesley and I'm special. Someone will hire me and give me a wonderful job and <laughs> pay nice money and it'll be great. You know, and then I got out here and it was the midst of a recession and I couldn't find a job. I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I, you know, temping, catering, horrible market research phone calls, asking people about their, how often they wipe the table and would they use this disinfectant, you know, that kind of horrible work. And uh, I started out uh, as an editor, copy editor, proofreader for uh, freelance and, and for a year on staff somewhere, realized very quickly I am not suited to detail-oriented work. Copy mm-hmm. editing is very, uh, very specific, uh, very detail-oriented. Uh, you know, if something's capitalized differently in Chapter 2 than it is in Chapter 13, you've got to make sure it's consistent, whereas I would just think, eh, who's there? nobody's ever going to notice, who cares, which is not the attitude that... Mm you can have it as a copy editor. So that didn't last long. And I thought, well, what about writing this stuff in the first place? So it was really a, this, you know, going to college does, uh, if nothing else, teach you uh, how to write. So no, it wasn't. And, and I, I just started, uh, I wrote a piece for the Sunday, San Francisco Sunday newspaper had a section where you could write little funny essays. And I wrote this thing that I thought at the time was funny looking back. Not so much. <laughs> but um, I got it published. I thought, well, this is fun. And I kept writing pieces for that section and then tried uh, the Sunday magazine, wrote some shorter pieces for them and realized this is this is extremely fun. I like writing. I didn't like it in college. I hated writing in college because, of course, in college you're writing papers. Hmm. Uh, that's essays, you know, uh, things. That's not really writing. It's, well, it's a kind of writing. It's a very specific and unpleasant kind of writing. Well, I have a I have a question there because this it, I need this to be a cautionary tale because thus far what I'm hearing is like you were essentially just like me. Let's go to parties, liberal arts. Everybody's going to give me a job. I'm amazing, and then, <laughs> and then you've turned into this best selling author. So now instead of the feeling I normally get asking these questions, which is ah, I can't, I can't do it, I'm like. Maybe I could. So what what was the transition from, you know, I'm going to just try and write this to I'm going to make a living. People are going to love my books, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what's the secret sauce there? Uh, you mentioned it before, which is that uh, that sense of I'm amazing, which somehow going to some little uh, private liberal arts college campus somewhere, you feel very special and amazing, even though you're really not. Uh, you have, And I, I guess some of that stayed with me because I, I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I can do this. Um, I, but I started at the really below the bottom, really. I, I was doing uh, pieces. The first the actual first piece I ever got published was the, it was for an advertising section, which is, you know, those supplements or those, those things that are stuck in the middle of a magazine and they look like they have articles. But yeah. Really, it's just an advertising thing. Yeah. Filler. I wrote filler. Uh, uh, those were the first things that I ever got published along with a couple of those little humor pieces. But I was thrilled. See, that's the thing I was, I, every pathetic loser step of the way, I was like, <laughs> look, look, I got published in the Sunday paper. People would be like, Mary, that's an ad. <laughs> I'm like, no, look, it's got my name on it. So I, I, the, the, I think the secret sauce was I was 
so delighted that anyone would uh, pay me anything to be writing because it, it is a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it a fun thing to do usually. Uh, so that, that I never, I didn't start out saying, hey, how do I get into the New Yorker? Or, hey, I want to be writing for the New York Times. I mean, I, I really, at the same time, I thought, I did sort of think, oh, I'm amazing and I can make a living writing. I also thought, I'm, I, I don't know how to do this and I'm going to, I have to start at the bottom because I don't know anyone. So, right. I, but I would, I enjoyed every step of that. I didn't ever, I, and I didn't live in New York. I think that was key. I didn't have to compare myself to these hyper successful uh, folks who came out of journalism school and went straight into a fabulous job writing for the Atlantic or whatever. Um, I, 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 I wasn't in a world of writers, so I, I didn't compare myself and feel shame that I was writing filler for the San Francisco Chronicle advertising. <laughs> sure. Yeah. sure. Well, do you think that, did you write for like uh, magazines and newspapers prior to, uh, and I don't mean like the Sunday, small Sunday paper, but the New York Times and whatnot. Did you write for them prior to becoming a book author? I did for about 15 years. I wrote uh -huh. for every, you, you name it. I, 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 I wrote around, right. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I, I believe it or not, I was a contributing editor at Vogue magazine. And if you've ever seen me, um, what I'm wearing, <laughs> uh, how, what my hair looks like, you, you can't believe I was on, they let me on the masthead of Vogue. I wasn't writing about fashion, obviously, but right. uh, yeah. So uh, a, a lot of, uh, outside Vogue, GQ, National Geographic, Discover. I did a lot of pieces for Discover and a magazine that started out with the name Hippocrates, which was a, a really fun, the, the fun, smart health medicine, the human body. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a, a, a way for me to travel and for to explore these sort of esoteric topics that had to do with the health and the human body. And that's, I think, where I started thinking this is a this is a world I like to explore and write about. Uh -huh. So, uh, and that was. Yeah, fairly early on in my writing career, I, I became a contributing editor at that magazine, as well as Discover, the science magazine. So sure. those two, uh, I wrote a lot for them. And the world of science, not just medicine, but, but science more broadly, was just a, a free ticket to all of these worlds and labs and things going on all over the world and all, all over the body. Uh, and I found that fascinating. So um, mag the, the magazine pieces that I did definitely shaped where my interests as a writer lay. Now, do you think that that is a pre prerequisite to becoming a published, you know, um, good author is, is to, I mean, is that the route? If looking back, would you go that same route or would you say, you know what? I could have started writing books 15 years earlier, which is my truest passion or, you know, yeah. strength. The latter, for sure. Oh, I, interesting. I think no, you definitely don't need to have been writing shorter pieces. Magazine publish, I mean, a book publisher really doesn't care whether you've spent time writing shorter pieces. They they care about two things: do you have a good and selling idea? You know, can they make some money off this idea? Will it have broad appeal? This idea that you have, and can you write? So you write a book proposal and you include a sample chapter and that sample chapter that you know that's got to be well written that that's where you really have to apply yourself and make that shine that's what they care about mm. they don't give a shit if you've spent any time at all writing for uh for publications you know, magazines or or uh, newspapers that uh, yeah you know, certainly it helps if you're a nationally known sure. columnist for the New York Times and you decide to you, you want to write a book that's going to help but it's definitely not a requirement and I I, I just I yeah I would have started I would have uh, tried to pitch a book ten years earlier I don't know that I would have been ready right right uh, I don't know how well that would have gone but <laughs> I would I always advise people if you've got a good idea pitch it pitch it now and and yeah youth sells if you're a you know hot young author. Um, that's even more appealing for a publisher. Um, um, social media matters now uh, more. If you have got, if you have a sizable following on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, that's that's something that a publisher will look for because it's easier to market the book. So that mm -hmm. doesn't matter. But um, spending time writing shorter pieces, nah, skip it. Yeah. Well, that is one of the things. I mean, we've talked to um, a couple of 
book agents, literary agents, and and um, writing about the podcast or whatever. And they said, yeah, you know, you could definitely submit something because you have an audience. It seems like now more than ever, the audience is almost the first thing they look for because you essentially do their job for them by selling it. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And there's, there are a couple of books that did phenomenally well that didn't have the publisher's uh, publicity machine behind it. One of them is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and that was a, a, by Rebecca Skloot. Huge, huge bestseller, probably still on the bestseller list. And, and, and that book, she spent about 10 years working on it, and the publisher wasn't going to do a traditional tour, so she said, well, screw it, I'll, I'll do it myself. She set it up. Uh, she'd set up college campus talks. She spent two years doing this. Wow. <laughs> so, and... And it was a huge success. So publishers now look at that and go, hey, why can't you do that? Well, right. I don't have two years to yeah. <laughs> devote to traveling around on my own expense. Um, I may be getting the details of her publicity tour slightly wrong, but it was a lot of her taking the initiative and doing it. So publishers see that and they and they, they do want to put it on to the author. But that's, you know, there's a lot of a lot of work that goes on in traditional publishing that it, that is sort of invisible. It, it goes on um, about a year out in talking to the bookstores. The sales reps get together with the people from the bookstores, and there's all this talk about you know what's coming out, and there's buzz generating that happens sort of in the within the industry, mm. and and that all uh, that all contributes as well as just you know the social media is certainly is great, but tough to make a go of it just on that, especially if you don't have that many followers. Right. And actually we touched on it, but do you have any specific views on self-publishing versus going the traditional route? Well, in, uh, in terms of making a living as an author, uh, it's, um, that's a, that's a tough one. Again, it comes down to, do you have a, do you have a, a, a big presence on social media? If you do, if you have a massive following for whatever reason, however you got there, uh, and you wanted to put the book out yourself as an as a downloadable entity and and col- and collect all the money yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I could imagine that that could be profitable, but just letting people know that that book exists right. uh, beyond your circle of friends and family, it seems to me like it would be a, a big challenge. I, yeah, I mean, people do it, and there's certainly the technology now to 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 much more easily do it, but. I like research and writing. I don't yeah. like the marketing, right? <laughs> Even um, you know, having to worry about cover design mm-hmm. or or the layout of the, the page and the font. I mean, you could, yeah, you, you're going to have to bring in a designer. I would imagine. Um, I'm sure there's templates you can use, but I so enjoy the relationship with my publishing house and the people in it. That all the steps along the way. Um, that that whole process, I've come to enjoy and really value the contributions that they all make. So um, I wouldn't want to switch. That's really interesting because I wonder if the reason why your relationship with your publisher is so great is because you're a, a an ATM machine <laughs> for them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I've also heard some, I don't know if horror stories is the right word, but it's a very cutthroat business. And it's like you make me money or... You're not worth my time and think, things like that. So, yes, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, have, I have been that person and had that experience as well. Because uh, I have foreign uh, publishers, my publishers in particularly the first one in the UK, same book, stiff. Yeah. Okay, here in the US, half a million, between a half a million, million copies sold. Uh-huh. In the UK, probably 10. <laughs> I, what? Same book. They didn't change anything, uh, different cover. Uh, the difference was uh, the pub- how invested the publisher was in it, and are they going to spend any time selling this book? Uh, there, wow. you know, the distribution was terrible. The, there was publicity, but the books weren't available anywhere in any stores at that time. The, the editor had left in the midst of the process. The new editor wasn't interested in the book. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, it absolutely depends on how attentive the publishers being and also um you know not to be mercenary but it depends on how much they spent up front if they spent yes hundreds of thousands of dollars up front they need to do a a certain level of publicity just to earn their money back they need to get that book out there and get attention otherwise they can't begin to hope to make their money back and i always caution writers who think you know if they're offered you know say 
forty thousand dollars for their book, and they think, well, yeah, that maybe it'll it'll catch on, and <laughs> from there, and I'm like, you know what? If you don't get the money up front, it's really tough. That I mean, there are stories where you know an independent bookseller hand sells the hell out of it, and it you know catches fire through word of mouth. That does happen, but it's it's such an uphill battle, right? That's interesting. It's definitely a unique business. I wanted to to get your take on, um, you know, I wanted to learn what your writing schedule is like, or or what, you know, the how how do you go about it? I mean, is it a, I wake up at five every morning, I write two thousand words, I da 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 da, or you know, everybody's <laughs> got their style, and I'd love to learn yours. Yeah, nothing gets me out of bed at five, <laughs> uh, except a book tour occasionally. Yeah, uh, I um. No, I tend to write in the afternoon because the morning is when, as as a, as a West Coast resident, I'm emailing people on the East Coast, and that sort of tapers off around one o'clock when the end of, when the end of the workday shows up. So I don't. Uh, I tend to work, do the research and the you know the interacting, sending emails and and talking to people that on the earlier part of the day, and then mid to late afternoon is when I write. And I'm always, or almost always, in the process of writing a book, I'm researching five or six chapters and writing one. So I, 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 as soon as I have enough material, I like to start writing a chapter, even though I don't know exactly where it will fit in the book. Oh. Uh, I, I, I try to be doing a combination of writing and researching. Of course, in the beginning, you're doing mostly research, and at the end, there's far more writing and less research. So, But, but for the bulk of it, I'm, I'm doing both. And the writing, you know, things kind of quiet down late afternoon. Right. And um, and it takes me at least a half hour, an hour to really get my head inside a chapter and settle down and write. And once I'm there, I've got a couple of hours where I can focus and remain hmm. attentive to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm rarely writing 2,000 a day. Whoa, that I dream of writing 2,000. Oh, no, I just made that up. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, two hundreds on uh, on some days. It's pathetic. <laughs> One of the things that caught my attention early on in our conversation is when you were talking about your lack of uh, detail. You know, you're you're not detail oriented, which yeah. I. One thousand percent, just totally understand. Luckily, I married somebody who is extremely detail oriented, so we balance each other out. But I'm wondering then: is you are you of the belief that I'm trying to get words down on paper cogently in an interesting way? But if it's not perfect or, you know, whatever, at least it's on paper and then I'll let the editor kind of because I look at writing as a very detail oriented profession because each word matters. So how do you do you just say I'm going to get it down and we'll worry about being perfect later? Yeah. You know, it's kind of like sculpture. Like you first you've got this mound of clay, right? It's kind of like that's that's your research materials that you've gathered in your reporting. So you have this pile of of clay, let's say, and I want to just throw down a really basic structure of like, first I'm going to be here. There'll be a scene at the lab and then I'm going to go step back, do some history. So just, I throw that, you know, throw it down on the page. You know, it's almost an outline, but it's not because that's too, too clean and tidy for me. (laughs) I just throw it, Throw it down the page, and I can begin to see a shape—a really vague, lumpy shape. And then I'll, uh, and I don't always start at the, in the first paragraph. Uh, I mean, it's it's nice to get a nice first paragraph that you kind of feel sets you off, but you don't have to. Just start, you know, I'll go in and I'll 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 rough out a paragraph, and I and I'll just throw it like you said, just get it down in a, in a really crappy form, and then go back and finesse it because I, I don't finesse it up front because I don't even know if I'm going to keep it or if it's going to move somewhere else. So I do a very rough, crappy version, just throwing it down there. And then when I'm convinced that that is the structure that the chapter is going to take, then I go back and, and really do the fine tuning and the finessing and the, the detailing. So mm-hmm. in the same way, I imagine somebody who's doing a sculpture of a human form would have first just a, a head <laughs> and then really kind of vague mounds where the nose and ears would be. And then you go in and do, you know, the, the pinna, the outer part of the ear, (laughs) (laughs) the lips, the eyelashes. So that's more the, the, the process. Okay. You know, and you don't have to start with the head. You can start with the knee, you know, whatever you feel like writing that day. But, but definitely I just, just, I have a, an office mate novella carpenter who's a, writes memoirs and, 
a lovely writer. And she's 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 like just vomit it out, just vomit it out, Mary. Huh? <laughs> just, just just like get it down, just so you know where you're going, and 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 you know because if you write this beautiful, perfectly crafted paragraph, and then you realize, you know what, this doesn't belong here. The setup is wrong. Mm. It's I, I'm not even going to use it. So I don't, you know, it feels like a waste of time. Sure. Well, and then, you know, we're going to talk about your books and and your most recent book in a minute. But research is a very important part of your writing. It's obvious. Yes. What yes. What does the research aspect look like? And how do you determine not just I'm going to Google a bunch of stuff, but like I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to talk to this expert. And yeah. I, I'm fascinated by that aspect of I'm going to fly to China, go to, you know, like how does that even come about? That's well, there's an initial period of random flailing of about that's like maybe two months of time where. I don't know. Even though I wrote a proposal for this book and I sold it, the proposal is meaningless. It's a sales tool. I may or may not include any of that uh-huh. material. I, maybe I'd say about half of it ends up in a book typically because um, I don't know anything really about the topic when I write that book proposal. It's just to give them a sense of the kind of stuff I could cover and they hopefully will trust that I'll go out and do a good job. But I, I spend the first couple of months um, calling around. I, it's almost more like what a documentary producer might do, figuring out what locations are we going to, where are we going to film. So I, for me, uh, I need, I want to have a place that I go that's interesting, where there's a setting with dialogue and people and things happening and something I can describe for the reader. So it's le- that's more important, and that's what the primary work that I do in research is is nailing down where am I going so it's a lot of emailing hey this is Mary Roach I'm working on a book about fill in the blank and wondered what's going to be going on in your lab slash weird facility slash prison slash space camp whatever it is <laughs> sure. uh, I, although I never went to a space camp <laughs> um I so and and, and, so, and that takes time because people uh like, well, there's a project I worked on, but I'm kind of, it's finishing up. And I'll say, well, do you know anyone else? I'm, I'm very clear with, with people uh, in describing what I need. I, you know, I say, just think of what's like the quirkiest, kind of most fascinating, weird place. I need to go somewhere. I need a scene. I don't want to talk about the facts right now. That they're, They come much later. They're like, that's almost like the filler. Right. Um, I So I... I just I get on the phone a lot. I email pe- strangers all uh, over and over and over. The first the first few months are hi, it's Mary Roach. I'm working on a book. What what do you think? Where should I go? What have you got? Go- what do you got for me? You got anything going on? Huh. Anything in the next year? What you know? What would you, what would you recommend I cover? And and um, so I do a lot of that. Sometimes poking around on the internet. Just uh, I'll find some facility that seems promising some place to go and then I'll target that place and I'll write to two or three people there try to get a sense it, I don't really ever know you know what, what these characters are going to be I've been very fortunate to have just landed on some delightfully um, passionate esoteric eccentric lovely people without really knowing until I got there I mean a lot of a lot of times I, you just don't know till you arrive what you're going to see uh, and, and what the person will be like. It, you, it, it, I just have sort of a gut sense of this is going to be a good scene. This is going to be a good setting for this topic. Like for Gulp, you know, the, I, I, I wanted to go all the way through the elementary canal. So we have at the very end the rectum. And I, like, there's no institute of rectal research. There's, <laughs> there's no obvious place to go. So I thought, well, what would be a way – you know what is the rectum? It's a storage facility, basically. So, what would be a place that you know where people that would highlight that? And I thought, okay, drug mules, people smuggling things in their rectums into uh, yeah. prison. You know, so I called the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation in California and explained this. And the guy amazingly is like, oh yeah, hooping. Wow, we've got a real problem at Avenal State Prison. I can, if you'd like to go there and interview some of the guards and inmates. I'm like, ding 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 ding. Wow. Yeah. That sounds great. Wasn't you know the, it, the science didn't come from that interview, but it was the perfect setting for me to uh, sh- sort of place these different elements that I wanted to talk about within this narrative structure of this guy, a murderer, as it turned out, 
uh, who had, was um, uh, known around the prison for his abilities as a as a hooper, and uh, he was willing to talk to me, and it was it was just a delightfully bizarre afternoon and a perfect narrative framework. But you know, you know it. I just you know it when you hear it or see it, right? So well, it's a lot of turning over rocks and just making random phone calls. Well, you know, I think. Despite any remaining questions I had about being an author, after you talk about the rectum being a storage facility, we just we just <laughs> got to get into it. There's no, there's, I mean, people are like, whoa, whoa, what? So, so you know, as I mentioned before we were recording, I kind of uh, found out about your writing through Gulp. I don't even know how I came across it. Um, read it, loved it, and that was my my hook. So that's the book I kind of want to focus on. Sure. Um, you know, the other ones you have. Uh, bonk which is about sex which essentially let's have another interview because that sounds amazing <laughs> i haven't read that one yet stiff which is about cadavers and then packing for mars um which yeah. i don't even know how you describe that that book i mean it's the about God, the humans well, going into space i guess is the yeah. quickest <laughs> yeah i mean you're taking humans off the planet for which they evolved and putting them in this environment without gravity yeah without heat without normal food without anything that they are used to on earth and it's a really trippy thing to do to the human body uh and there's a lot of uh science that goes on around trying to make that livable so it's a just a uh and a, a, you know it's a, people write about space space travel but it tends to be apollo 13 you know, right picture story or a, a you know a biography of somebody in that world but there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on on earth it's really uh, kind of trippy and fun so that that, science, that chunk of science is what that book's about yeah and then of course spook which is about the afterlife so i just wanted to say that so people are like okay all these topics incredible uh so you know go check those out if you want we'll focus on gulp as you mentioned the alimentary canal what yes. what first of all Two things. One, what made you think of this? Two, what is the alimentary canal? Alimentary canal is everything between the nose and the tail, really. mouth. It's that tube that runs from the mouth all the way through to the ass. And it's a weird, it's just, uh, it's almost more like the outside world than part of your body. So it's a very weird environment. And, you know, I, of course, being Mary Roach, I focused on sort of uh, unusual elements of it. Uh, it's not, there's nothing really about digestion or, or absorption of nutrients or there's no, not a lot of practical advice in the book. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a weird world in there. And, and, uh, I wanted it to sort of be, you know, kind of, I liked the word alimentary canal, kind of like the Panama canal, you know, you would, t- you could take a boat down and it would be in, like sort of a, an expedition. How'd you come to it? I mean, I wonder how you come to all your topics and because I guarantee you're just a genuinely, insanely curious person. I'm the exact same way. That's what the podcast is. It was like, how do I learn as much as possible? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The curio- it's, it's definitely curiosity inspired. Uh, the, the Alimentary Canal is um, a no-brainer for, for a Mary Roach book. I can't believe I didn't think of it sooner huh. uh, just because it's uh, – you know, chewing and the mouth, I mean, then the tongue um, and, and what, go, you know, oral processing. There's a whole science of oral processing and, and people in Denmark who study this and, oh, not, no, the Netherlands, sorry. Uh, and, and then uh, Fletcherism, I have a chapter on that, of this belief in the, um, around World War One. There, there was this guy who believed that if you chewed food like 700 times, mm-hmm. you, you would, you'd extract more nutrients from it. And, and uh, so he had the, it was this global cult of, crazy chewing uh so uh and um of course flatulence there's three chapters <laughs> we've got exactly. smell we've got flammability and we've got uh how do you research it the history of flatulence research mm-hmm. uh so there's just uh um and, and just i love the juxtaposition of science with a capital s science you know very dignified thing and then every now and then science has to walk over into the world of uh, sexual intercourse or mm-hmm. flatulence or uh, whatever it is. And, it, and that kind of surreal juxtaposition uh, uh, fascinates me. So Gulp was a, a fairly, I guess that there were, there were topics along the way that I researched that were really interesting that I didn't have a place to put. And then I thought, you know, well, what would be the umbrella? Well, 
uh, obviously, you know, the whole, just do the whole canal, just start at the mouth and go all the way through. So it was a, just made a lot of sense as a, a, a book for the likes of me. Sure. Well, and actually that's a good thing to point out. You know, humor is just pervasive in all of your writing. And I remember now, I, I can't remember who the author was, but an author similar to you, I mean, just very distinguished. It might've been Dan Pink. I, I can't remember, but saying that, look, the first thing you have to do is be funny. I'm just, he was like, whoever this person was, I remember as a guy was like, you gotta be funny to sell books. And talking to you, it's like, that's one of the things you do. Was that on purpose? Is that just how you are? Like, it's, it's just more fun for me. Uh, and, and he's right. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't think of myself as particularly funny, but, but the funny comes from not so much how I write, but I gravitate toward these topics that will lend themselves to humor. And sometimes mm. it's just that the, the material itself is funny, whether it's because of the subject or that sometimes his things that happened in the 1800s are just in the world of science and medicine are just very strange and, uh, funny. So I'm, I'm choosing what I include in the book by its potential for some fun and hu and humor. Mm -hmm. So, so right up front, I'm, you know, like the, the gulp, you'll notice there's nothing on the liver because <laughs> the livers, there, there's no humor in the liver. There's just, it's not a funny organ. Right. I didn't, I couldn't find a way into the liver. There's no interesting, you know, uh, 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 compared to say the rectum. Right. The rectum, I was going to say the, the intestines are weird and there's all kinds of interesting things the the stomach also uh is a bizarre place the liver is a, it's kind of a bore really i mean not if you're if you actually know something about it I'm, I'm sure the liver is extremely interesting but just from a quick take on a you know on a, on a, on a just a purely a uh an amateur's take it's it's a it's a kind of a snooze the liver so so okay, okay let's forget it I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do the liver just gonna do the tube just, you know, the actual, well, everything along the tube. So, um, I, you know, and if, but I t I'm telling you, if the liver was fascinating and weird. It'd and, be in and, there. Oh, I would have put it in there, even <laughs> though it doesn't belong. Yep. It's funny because, like, as you mentioned, right, uh, the rectum, it's hilarious. And it is hilarious because I can't even hear the word rectum without <laughs> thinking, damn near killed him. Damn near killed him. Like, I can't even, it's already funny. I say it and I'm laughing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, right, too, it's too easy. You take the easy way out. Oh, yeah. And like, the, exactly. I'm very indulgent and lazy. It's like, I let the material be funny for me. You, you, you know, if you, you could knock yourself out trying to be funny about the liver and, and fall on your face, which it, it wouldn't be funny. Right. Uh, there, and, and there are, you know, okay, the tongue doesn't necessarily seem that funny, but the tongue, uh, you know, you, so you got to dig a bit. Like, you know, this place that I was going in the Netherlands, <laughs> they have a tongue camera <laughs> and that's funny huh a tongue camera i don't know it's just i didn't even even see the tongue camera but i was like okay this is a place that has a tongue camera that's kind of weird yeah and, and fascinating and probably funny right well you know i was thinking i was like how where did i come across this because i was like fascinated when it first came out and i it hit me it was a discussion about bacteria and bacteria yeah. in the digestive tract. And I've, I got really interested in how our stomach biome, how much it controls. Like that was the thing I was really yeah. in for a while. And I think that's how I came across it. So th tell us about that. Like, let's, let's have a little learning session about what you found in regards to kind of the bacteria in our body that really kind of controls us, if you will. Well, sure. Um, it's the intestine. Uh, the stomach is um, what it's doing actually is the is is killing bacteria. The stomach is sort of a first line of defense for food coming in to sterilize it. So the stomach, there is bacteria. N not very many uh, species can survive in the acid environment of, of the stomach. Uh, so, but you go down into the intestine, and it's a whole other story. It's um, it's a teeming cesspool of bacteria. Um, it's something like a third by weight of your shit, not the water part, it, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, is bacteria. I mean, it's a it's just trillions and trillions of bacteria, and it, you need to think of them. It's not them versus you. They are you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's more like, you know, it's like, who's, 
who's controlling who who's who owns whom right. is really a, a valid question. Uh, and and the bacteria, I mean, first of all, they're essential. They're breaking down food into the components that you can actually absorb and use. Uh, and in some of the animal parts of the animal world. That breaking down doesn't happen until the second pass. And these are animals that eat their own shit as part of their daily diet. Like uh, rabbits. Who does that? <laughs> Rab- rat- rabbits, for, for example. Didn't know that. And rats, uh, mice, uh, the, I, I believe. Because um, there, was, there was a guy who studied, uh, was, he was a nutritionist, and he was using either rats or mice, I'm now forgetting, uh, as his subjects. And he kept... Uh, uh, getting frustrated because he was trying to feed them the things he wanted to feed them and they were eating each other. They're like just sort of, as it comes out the hole, they're eating. He's like, God, stop that. And then he realized they're doing this for a reason. That, and then he became interested in, in that and that actually became his research. Um, cicatropes, I think is the word for eating your own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's uh, you get you get different nutrients on the second pass. So for some of these animals, they can't break everything down. So they just that's that's lunch. It's a regular part of the day. That's so it's, gross. Uh, it's gross. Yeah, it's kind of gross. We don't have to do that, thankfully. Well, and actually, did you find that? I think I read somewhere, but you know, we are uh, evolutionarily repulsed by our feces because it will do us harm. Well, feces in general is, uh, um, yeah. If someone has a virus, uh, they're shedding virus in their that there's virus in the feces. There's there's occasionally harmful bacteria. There's a lot of harmless bacteria for the most part. Um, so your own and uh, probably eating your own while unpleasant. Probably. Oh God, I can't. Yeah, I can't. It's already, it's already in there, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't recommend it. I haven't tried it personally. Oh my God. Um, but someone else's, you don't, you know, you you don't know what they they have, and you would be at risk for uh, picking that up, either a bacteria, a virus. Through through yeah, so that it makes good sense that that that's a repulsive item to right. us. It's a evolutionarily, it's a it's a survival mechanism, sure. Well, and it, as it come as you know, we're on this topic. You also cover um, in the beginning actually the idea of palatability, and I was wondering if you could discuss kind of what determines you know what we find palatable. I know you talk about how we think that other animals should find the same things delightful and they don't. So I was hoping you could uh, give us a little description there for those that haven't read the book. Oh, sure. Well, other, other animals. Yeah. I mean, uh, cats, for example, taste this. Um, there's the, 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 um, I spent some time at a place where they, they make the flavor coatings for kibble which is the thing that gets the animal excited about eating the kibble, which, like a Dorito, when you take off the coating, really has no flavor hmm. at all. So, uh, and, and for cats and dogs, it's complete, and for people, too, um, it's completely different. Um, cats, uh, cats don't respond to sweet. Dogs do. Cats, uh, there's this um, substance, this py- uh, pyrophosphate, I, really, I believe. It's been a while since I read the chapter. But that is some, something that it's like they've described it, these people at this company. I've described it as cat crack. The like cats mm. love the taste of this. I tried it in, in a solution of water. Just nothing. It, it just tastes like strange. <laughs> just It's the taste of strange. Like, what is that? I don't know. It is, it's, not, it's nothing in our the spectrum of what we respond to as delicious or tasty or, or edible, uh, but cats love it. Um, and mice, uh, mice love sweet. Uh, some, some cats don't taste it. So there, and I, you know, that I don't know the whole spectrum of the animal kingdom and what they, uh, taste and re- respond to, but probably there's all kinds of bizarre tastes and flavors, uh, that, that are delicious that, to them, that are to us just weird or non-existent or you just can't taste it. And within, within, you know, within, the human race there, there there's genetic differences there, of course people uh, cilantro or bitter items and if you're so the degree to which you taste and respond to bitter there's a lot of there's a genetic difference in that i noticed that's one of the things if you do 23 and me it will tell you if you're a yeah a, a person who who likes or dislikes bitter foods or uh, I, th- I think it was just the bitter one that they had on there. They do um, talk about cilantro in that too. I they almost do. did 23 so, and yeah. me, but I, I haven't yet. And then actually I recently found a company that will do your entire genome for like a thousand bucks. 
which really? is yeah it's it, it was this big article um you know the first below sub thousand dollar kind of human genome mapping or something like that i highlighted it and i have it as a bookmark because i really want to do it yeah but it's like what happens if they come back and say oh you really are gonna get colon cancer <laughs> like, uh, yeah right well, well shit 23 me has had to back off and they don't give you any medical information because it, it turned out to be pretty inaccurate i believe there was some story in the times about how they there were three different companies that did what 23 and me did uh and the results were so far apart wow you know, uh, in terms of your likelihood of getting certain diseases it's a shame they, yeah so <laughs> they they don't even do it anymore but the, the, yeah i would I, I don't know if i want to know yeah exactly well one of the things and and here's again this is typical you know mary roach style is you cover so many things in the book and there it's basically like Let's take really interesting questions relating to one subject and answer them. And so one of the ones that I actually didn't know, and many people might, but for those don't, is how Elvis died. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you give it away for us? Can you kind of, you know, this is just for, for those listening. This is just the kind of thing you learn in Gulp and in obviously in your other books. So let's hear it. Yeah, well, I was at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, which is this wonderful museum of medical curiosities. And the showpiece of the Mütter Museum is a mega colon. And it is bigger around than my waist, which is 27 inches or so, 28. This, uh, and that's huge for a colon. I mean, a colon is normally, what, like four inches around or less. It's a, it's a, a huge, it's grossly <laughs> distended and becomes useless and um, impacted and Elvis had a mega colon. It, the the Mütter Museum does not have Elvises, I should say. But I was there at the Mütter Museum and I saw this. And the the curator said to me, "Oh yeah, Elvis died of that." And I was like, "What? Elvis Presley died of him? He had one of these? I mean, well, not as big." Uh, so I called Elvis Presley's longtime doctor, Nick Needles Nick. Nicopolis, who's still alive, who lives in Memphis in a house that Elvis gave him. Hmm. And, um, and and he had writ actually written a book uh, that didn't get a lot of coverage. It's called Elvis and Dr. Nick. <laughs> he should have just called it Elvis's ass and people would have like known all I about know. it. Yeah, I, I know. And he had a picture of himself with Elvis on the cover. And it was just, so anyway, it didn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, widely covered this book anyway i contacted him and went to interview him yeah elvis elvis had horrible problems with constipation as one does with a megacolon because the peristalsis that moves material along uh doesn't work toward down at the end of the colon sometimes this is a genetic thing where they just the nerves don't go all the way down so stuff would build up and, and until it just sort of reached a point where it kind of like pushed through on its own. Oh, my God. Um, uh, so Elvis, there were times when Elvis would be on stage, and from week to week, people would think he had gained and lost weight. But in fact, he'd just taken a really big dump. Wow. And it was horrible. I mean, and Dr. Nick was talking about how, um, I mean, it was, you know, it was, they'd have to, they traveled with boxes and boxes of fleets enemas. They'd have to time them right so he wouldn't have to leave stage. It was horrible, debilitating condition that he had and um obviously the drugs didn't help because right. if you're on uh, I mean, some drugs like opiates constipate you like right. shut everything down which is the last thing somebody with megacolon needs um and, and elvis was was not diagnosed with that until much later I mean, it's, it's it's normally something that becomes evident when the person is a, is a kid but uh priscilla didn't want to talk about it so dr nick didn't know and his parents at that time weren't alive. He, just, he didn't have a sense of, like, was was this a condition from childhood um, or, or is it something that developed later? So um, it was presumed to be megacolon. And at death, the autopsy describes just a phenomenally, uh, horribly impacted, distended colon. I don't have the circumference in my head right now. It's in the, You'll have to buy the book to find <laughs> the actual circumference of Elvis Presley's colon at death. But anyway... Yeah. But he, he, he did die on the toilet. He did die on the toilet. Um, there's something called defecation-induced sudden death, I believe it is, and that is when you are pushing so hard that you uh, end up with a heart arrhythmia that can be fatal. Uh, so it's a 
um, that's why heart patients, pe- people with uh, in peril of cardiac arrest with a weak heart in, in ICU, they will have them on a stool softener mm. so that they don't push too hard. Because if you're having to use a bedpan, that's an awkward position. And this is probably way more detailed than <laughs> you don't want it to get into. No, I mean, look, it's the weird and the interesting. And, you know, in my mind, as we're discussing this, the silver lining is this, right? You can take one of the most well-known people in the history of, I don't know, maybe you could call it mankind, you could call it the past you know, century, whatever, um, and he died taking a shit. Like, you were all human, and you go out in various ways, you better enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Everybody's got right. their thing. I mean, that is yeah. the silver lining there. Yeah, we exactly. We're all just big bags of guts walking around with a computer up on the top, moving the legs and moving the shit and you know that's ultimately that's it all we are kind of D- doesn't get more human than that me. <laughs> <laughs> well you know again i i know we're coming up on time here i want to say thank you for for putting this stuff out in the world for keeping it interesting and for the curious that we all are especially those listening to the show you know i've found i've so all i read is nonfiction. it's just it's my curse And over time, I found I had about 200 unfinished books and about 30 finished books. And it's because the finished ones had a way of incorporating enjoyment and laughter along the way, you know, and that's what you do. And I love that style. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. I I really enjoyed it. Thank you for being on the show. I wanted to give this time, you know, for those that are listening, where should they go? I mean, obviously you have these great books. They're not hard to find. We're going to link to them at smartpeoplepodcast.com. But are there other places, you know, your website, do you write other places, articles, things like that, that people can find you? I would steer people to the books. I occasionally do write for magazines, but um, not with any regularity. So um, just, yeah, the books are all easily findable in bookstores and on various websites. And at maryroach.net. <laughs> yeah, and at maryroach.net, which I need to update. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I like the website. Are you active on social? Uh, I'm on Twitter, although I haven't been active lately. I will gear up again uh, <laughs> as, as we get closer to when the next book comes out in June. Fantastic. All right, Mary, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Have a great day. Okay, take care. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Mary Roach. You can find all of her books, Stiff, Bonk, Packing for Mars, Gulp, Spook, and more at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And if you do purchase any of Mary's books through Amazon, don't forget to use the smartpeoplepodcast.com Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Hope everybody made it through the Blizzard 2016 safely, had a little bit of fun, maybe got some days off from work. Tucker says hello. Maybe you hear him barking in the background. We've got a lot of really great episodes coming up, so stay tuned, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>